pastors, seminarians, and saints from all over the world who came to the Shincheonji Online Seminar, Testimony on Prophecy and Fulfillment of Revelation, God's New Covenant. Welcome. I am the moderator, Pyeon Jejun. I am truly happy to be with you in the place where the words of Revelation are being widely opened and testified all over the world after being sealed for 2,000 years. We are receiving endless inquiries from pastors all over the world who want to directly check the secrets of the kingdom of heaven through the word of God in which there is life. I believe this is because they have experienced their thirsty souls being quenched and awakened by the word of revelation, which is the water of life. I would also like to express my gratitude to the broadcasters around the world who are blowing the trumpet through live broadcasting and news reports at a time when the true words of the book of revelation are being trumpeted online. We will begin the seminar by giving thanks to God for guiding your steps to know the true meaning of God's new covenant revelation. We will pray in one heart together. Holy Father God, who is full of love and grace, Thank you so much for giving us today for the Shincheonji Online Seminar, Testimony on the Prophecy and Fulfillment of Revelation, God's New Covenant, so that we can receive grace with the precious word of life and become one in the truth to glorify you, Father God. Now is the time when all of the words of prophecy that Jesus gave 2,000 years ago are fulfilled, and we have gathered at this precious time so that all of the brothers and sisters of faith who hope for the kingdom of heaven can be united in one heart to share the bread of life, receive grace, and share hope. Please pour down the wisdom of heaven on us to fully understand all of the words so that it'll be a blessed time to engrave these words in our hearts. All of us believe in the promise of God and Jesus and the hope that is promised. May this time be the precious time to fully enjoy the grace through the fulfillment according to the promise and to realize once again God's purpose and the hope of the believers. Please clothe the tribe leader who testifies the word at this time with the fullness of the Holy Spirit and may this time be the time of grace that we become one with the millions of angels in heaven to give glory to you. We give thanks and pray in the holy name of Jesus who brought us from death to life. Amen. Yes, we would like to inform you that today's online seminar is being conducted in strict compliance with quarantine rules and social distancing. Today, you will learn the words of Revelation chapter 11, continuing from Revelation 10, through the tribe leader, Chang Bangshik, of the Matthias tribe. If we would summarize Revelation 11 in one phrase, it would be the two witnesses and the seventh trumpet. In this chapter, there is a promise about the two witnesses whom Jesus is with. What do these two witnesses testify? And whose witnesses are they? And, in the last time, in Revelation chapter 10, it was said that when the seventh trumpet is sounded, the mystery of God will be accomplished, just as he announced to his servants the prophets. That trumpet is sounded today in Revelation 11. What is this trumpet? And what is accomplished? Let us try to understand the amazing mystery hidden inside at this time. We will have the tribe leader, Chang Bangshik, of the Matthias tribe, who will testify to that mystery. Let us give a big round of applause. Hello to all the pastors, seminarians, and believers from all over the world. Today we will continue from last time and we will testify to the words of Revelation chapter 11 
of the testimony on the prophecy and fulfillment of Revelation, God's new covenant. I sincerely hope that you will all have a precious time to enter into the Bible today and fully understand the word. The title of Revelation chapter 11 is The Two Witnesses and the Seventh Trumpet. The Two Witnesses and the Seventh Trumpet. Let's divide the main reference today into three parts. We will take a look at the relationship between the two witnesses and the seventh trumpet, and the sound of the seventh trumpet, and the reality of the seventh trumpet. First, let's take a look at the relationship between the two witnesses and the seventh trumpet. When the two witnesses of Jesus finish their testimony, they are sacrificed by the beast from the abyss. After three and a half days, they are resurrected and come back to life, and after this, they sound the seventh trumpet, proclaiming the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. What is the sound of the seventh trumpet? As we learned in Revelation chapter 10, verse 7, in the previous time, it is the mystery of God. I hope that we keep this in mind, that it's the mystery of God that has never been heard of before. And what is this mystery about? It is about the kingdom of the world becoming the kingdom of God. And this is the content of Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. And this is the most important content that we will learn today. And because it becomes the kingdom of God, the martyred spirits in God will be resurrected as well. And those who are living will be changed, and eternal life will be accomplished. This is the content of this mystery according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 to 54. And what is the reality of this seventh trumpet? In one phrase, this is the new John, the promised pastor of the New Testament. Then who is this new John? As we learned in Revelation chapter 10 last time, he is the one who has received the word and has seen and heard all the events of the entire book of Revelation, meaning he is a witness. When Jesus received the scroll that was sealed with seven seals from the hand of God and opened up the seals one by one and completed it, there was one who had seen and heard himself. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 2, it says that, I, John, testify to the words of God and to everything that he had seen. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 8, it says, I, John, am the one who has heard and seen the events of the entire book of Revelation. Apostle John saw the vision before it was fulfilled, but when it is fulfilled, he sees the reality. When prophesying, even if one wants to see the actual fulfillment, he cannot see it because they do not exist yet. But when the prophecy fulfills, the actual entities appear so they can be seen and testified about. In order to receive the kingdom of heaven and eternal life, all nations must meet and receive the revelation through the new John, who has received the revelation from Jesus. The reason for this is that in John chapter 17 verse 3 it says that eternal life is to know the true God and the one whom he has sent. But how can we know God? In Matthew chapter 11, verse 27, it says that only through the revelation can we know the true God and the one whom He has sent. As we have already learned in Revelation chapter 10, the revelation of Jesus is in the stomach of the new John, essentially. And so we must meet and receive this revelation from the new John who has received the revelation of Jesus so that we can come to know this true God and Jesus and the promised pastor and live forever. Now let's take a look at this overview of Revelation chapter 11. First, it says that there is a temple that has to be measured, and there is the outer court that should not be measured. At that time, the two witnesses of Jesus, clothed in sackcloth, bring various plagues, and then they are killed by the beast. The two witnesses of Jesus, clothed in sackcloth, bring various plagues, and then they are killed by the beast. 
However, after three and a half days, they receive the breath of life and they are resurrected. At that time, the seventh trumpet is sounded. There is a wonderful mystery that the kingdom of God will be established in this world when the seventh trumpet is sounded. Let's keep these five things in mind first. Now let's read Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. Revelation 11, verses 1 and 2. I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and was told, Go and measure the temple of God and the altar, and count the worshippers there. But exclude the outer court, do not measure it, because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. Yes, you've read well. This chapter is a continuation from Revelation chapter 10. And when we look at the entire book of Revelation, there's a person, I, as an I saw or I looked. We all know that this is Apostle John before the things were fulfilled. But at the time of the fulfillment, there is a new John. In these verses, it says that he receives a reed like a measuring rod. And he is commanded to measure the temple and the altar of God and to count the worshippers there. And he is also told to exclude the outer court. Do not measure it, because it has been given to the Gentiles. And they will trample on the holy city for 42 months, is what it says. New John, after receiving the open scroll, the words of the book of Revelation in Revelation chapter 10, here in chapter 11, he receives a reed like a measuring rod and is told to measure the temple and count the worshippers in it. Let's first understand what this reed like a measuring rod is. Just as a staff or a rod is a tool that helps the people while they are walking, this means that there is a partner of the new John that the new John receives as he goes on this path of God. We can think of him as a spiritual companion or a spiritual friend who helps the new John. But this person is described as a reed. Reeds are flimsy, right? A tool for measuring, but weak. In reality, he was a worker who was supposed to help the new John. And what we should remember is that he was one of the saints of this tabernacle of the seven golden lampstands. What is God's temple here? In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, Apostle Paul said, Do you not know that you are the temple of God? In the Old Testament before Jesus came, the temple of God was a physical building. However, from the time of Jesus, just as Jesus said, Destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. Paul was telling us that we should know that the temple was Jesus' heart. Then who are the temple of God here? In Revelation chapter 3 verse 4, there are few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes and Jesus walks with them. So they are the temples that the Lord is together with. These are the people who are said to come before the throne of God, overcoming the beast and the image and the number of his name. And so God says to measure the temple, and there are these two types of temples. First, there is this tabernacle temple that was mentioned in Revelation chapter 13. But the destroyer, the Gentile from the sea, enters inside. There is a tabernacle temple that is established first, and there is a Gentile destroyer who enters and destroys it. At that time, there is a small group of people who fights and overcomes the destroyers and comes out. Who is together with them? God is together with them. And because these people see and testify to the betrayal and destruction, they become the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony. When God says to measure, He is referring to this temple here, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony where God is with. 
If we compare this to the time of Moses, this tabernacle temple is like the holy place because there is a lampstand here. And because God was with the most holy place, this temple of the tabernacle of the testimony is like that most holy place. Who are these worshippers in the temple of God? These people are the few who follow the new John, the overcomer, and they worship together as one. Whether it be in the mountains or in the field, where people gather to worship God, isn't that considered as a temple? And what does it mean to measure? It is to measure the amount of faith and the knowledge that these people have. In Ezekiel chapter 47, It says that when God's great temple is built on this earth, there is a great amount of water of the word that flows out of there. At that time, they are measured four times with the measuring tape. In the same way, it is to measure the amount of knowledge and faith that these people have. And there is the outer court of the temple that is trampled on by the Gentiles. What kind of place is the outer court? Just as we have seen in the picture earlier, we are talking about the tabernacle temple that had betrayed in which the beast had entered. It is the same place that appears in Revelation chapters 13, 6, and 2, and 3. And who are the Gentiles who come in and trample there? We are talking about the organization of the seven-headed and ten-horned beast that had swallowed up the tabernacle temple. And where is this place? When we look at Revelation chapters 13 and 12, it is known as the Tabernacle of Heaven. Those who do not belong to the Tabernacle of Heaven were seen as the Gentiles in God's eyes. And their reality is a stewardship education center and the seven pastors who were there. The Stewardship Education Center was an institution that educated the pastors at that time. And so their power and authority was great. We are talking about the famous seven pastors that were there. These pseudonyms here, Mr. Tang, Mr. Kim, Mr. Hang, Mr. Wan, Mr. Kim, Mr. Pak, Mr. Tang. Again, these are pseudonyms. What is the reason for trampling the outer court? It is because God's chosen people had betrayed and did not repent, and so He wants to judge them. What about the 42 months in which they are trampled? If we look at Revelation chapter 13, verse 5, it says that the Gentiles will rule over the chosen people who betrayed for these 42 months. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 21 to 22, it is said that the days of tribulation have been cut short in order to physically save those whom God has chosen. In the Old Testament, in Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 11, we see that the chosen people of Israel were destroyed by the Gentile nation of Babylon for 70 years due to their sin. If we go through tribulation for 70 years, all of our flesh would die. And so the 70 years were reduced to three and a half years in order to give salvation in the flesh to the elect. And we must understand what a tremendous blessing this is. Now let's read verses 3 through 5. Revelation 11 verses 3 to 5. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. You've read well. The reference verses here are about the two witnesses dressed in sackcloth. These are the two witnesses who were given power by Jesus to prophesy for 1,260 days in this sackcloth. Then who are the two witnesses here? In Revelation chapter 10, there is a new John who received and ate the open scroll. And in chapter 11, there is a person who is compared to a reed like a measuring rod whom the new John receives. These two people here are called as two witnesses or Jesus' two witnesses. What we do need to pay attention to here, though, is that the only witness who works by receiving the word directly from the work of the Holy Spirit is a new John. 
How do we know this? In Revelation chapter 1 verse 2, it says that John testifies the word of God and everything that he had seen. And in Revelation chapter 22 verse 8, it is saying that I, John, am the one who has heard and seen all these things, referring to a person. Here, they are said to be wearing sackcloth. And what is this sackcloth? It means the words that urge the repentance of the actions that have led to death. It says that the two witnesses are prophesying for 1,260 days in sackcloth. The Israelites used to wear sackcloth and mourn when they repented of their sins and when someone had passed away. This is a parable using the customs of Israel. And we can see this in Luke chapter 10, verse 13. And so to wear sackcloth means to do the work of making people repent. And prophecies are about the things regarding the future. In Amos chapter 3, verse 7, it says that God reveals His plans first to His servants, the prophets. And so these witnesses received what was going to happen in the future by the Lord, and they prophesied about it. And the two witnesses are also called here as the two olive trees and the two lampstands. We will take a look at what the two olive trees and the two lampstands are, and if they are people, and if so, who they are. These two olive trees refer to the two witnesses who serve the Lord on this earth. In Zechariah chapter 4, verses 11 to 14, it is said that these two olive trees are the two witnesses who serve the Lord of all the earth. And so the testimony of these people is a testimony of Jesus. It would not be an exaggeration to say that they speak on behalf of Jesus. Since they are also called as the two lampstands, it shows that they are together with the seven spirits of the seven lamps before God's throne that we had seen in Revelation chapter 4 verse 5. And the two witnesses who are the two olive trees. Let's take a look at why these two olive trees are necessary. For us believers, we should receive Jesus when He returns, right? It is written that only by preparing this olive oil can we meet the bridegroom Jesus who is the light according to Matthew chapter 25. Only the wise virgins who have prepared the lamps and the oil will be able to greet him. In Psalms 119 verse 105, it says that the lamp is the word of God. What about the oil then? In Exodus chapter 27 verse 20, it says that the olives were pressed to make oil and this was the oil that was used to light the lamps. Leviticus chapter 24 verses 1 to 3 says the same thing. Just as olive oil comes out of the olive tree, because the two olive trees are the two witnesses, the word of testimony of the two witnesses refers to this olive oil. And so, saying this surprising fact that only those who receive the word from the two witnesses can be the wise virgins and welcome Jesus, the bridegroom. And it says, if anyone tries to harm the two witnesses, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. Out of the mouths of the two witnesses, will physical fire actually come out to set their enemies on fire? We should understand that this is a parable. As we know well, fire refers to God's word of judgment. In Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 14, it says that I will make my words in your mouth a fire, and these people the wood that it consumes. Let's take a look at the time of the first coming when these words were fulfilled. In Luke chapter 12, verse 49, Jesus said, I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. This fire was the word of judgment. And because this fire is a parable, we should understand that the enemies who are devoured were also a parable. Who were these enemies? It is talking about the evil spirits that were inside of the false prophets. And it can also be the falsehood that they speak. In Revelation chapter 16, verse 13, it says that out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, the false prophets and the people, that these evil spirits were coming out. 
And so the evil spirits and the falsehood from the false prophets are the enemies that are being devoured. Let's now read verses 6 through 10 from the main reference. Revelation 11, verses 6 to 10. These men have power to shut up the sky so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have the power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Now, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, men from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts, because these two prophets have tormented those who live on the earth. You've read well. The reference verses here is about the event where the two witnesses are killed after bringing various plagues. Let's take a look at the various plagues brought by the two witnesses. It says that they will shut up the sky so that it will not rain anymore, and also that they turn the waters into blood. Will it really be possible for these two men to shut up the sky so that there will not be any more rain? We must understand that this is a parable. What does it mean? It means to stop the saints who are together with these witnesses so that they will not deliver the words to the outer court of the temple. And what is in the sky? In heaven, there are the sun, moon, and stars. In Genesis chapter 37, verses 9 through 11, Jacob's family is compared to as a sun, moon, and stars. Therefore, just as the place where Jacob's family is gathered is called as heaven, the place where the new John and the group of the few people who have gathered together can be called as heaven. And so the place where the saints who are with the new John, the witness, are located, that place is called as heaven. And they are stopped from preaching the word of God to the outer court of the temple. And why is that? In Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 2, it says that the rain from heaven is God's teaching, God's words. But in Isaiah chapter 5 verses 3 to 7, God commands the clouds not to rain. Rain is the word of God, and the word of God comes from the Holy Spirit, and so it means that the Holy Spirit does not allow this to take place. And regarding the water turning into blood, if we look at the time of Moses, he struck the water of the Nile with the staff, and this water changed into blood so that the people could not drink it. In the same way, through the word of revelation, the doctrine of the destroyers, which is like the waters of the Nile, is revealed to be lies and falsehood. Here, as the two witnesses Call the false prophets, who are like the beasts of the abyss, that you are the devil, you are the destroyers. These beasts end up killing the two witnesses spiritually. What is the beast of the abyss? First, let's find out what the abyss is. Here, as drawn on the screen, uh, these Chinese characters, it means no and bottom. And so it means a bottomless chasm or a bottomless pit. Because water is the word of God, a cistern that cannot hold water would refer to an organization without the word of God, in other words, hell. And that is why the false prophets belonging to Satan's dwelling, or hell, are called as the beasts. In Revelation chapter 9, verses 2 to 3, we learned about this before. The locusts that are like the beasts with the devil come out of the abyss and they torture the people of God's tabernacle. In Proverbs chapter 30, verses 2 to 3, it is not talking about a physical beast, but a person who does not know God and God's word is considered a beast.
And so the beast of the abyss refers to a false pastor who belongs to Satan's dwelling, in other words, hell. Now, what about the two witnesses finishing their testimony? When these two witnesses have finished saying what they have to say, then their testimony is over. If they say that you have done this and you have done that, you belong to the devil and you're the destroyer, that is testifying everything. Now it says that the beasts kill the two witnesses and the witness is a person who gives the testimony but if they stop the witness from testifying it is as if their role is being put to death. Now let's take a look at the great city where the dead body of the two witnesses are lying. If they were physically dead, then they must be in graves, in tombs. But since they are in this great city, the corpse here is a spiritual corpse, and the great city is a spiritual great city. The great city is a place where God had worked that was a tabernacle temple, and there were about 80 branch churches, and so that's why it's a great city. Now, how great would their power be since the destroyers came and united with them too? This great city referred to the tabernacle temple that became part of the Gentiles. There was a tabernacle temple, and who entered this place? The destroyers came, and they joined hands together, and it was this great city. This dead body refers to the state in which these two witnesses were not able to testify. And this great city was figuratively called as Sodom and Egypt, where also the Lord was crucified. Why is this? According to Hosea chapter 12, verse 10, God had shown many visions, it says. He did not show the actual entities at that time. And it says that through the prophets, God had spoken parables. Sodom was a place that was destroyed. And the corruption of this tabernacle was likened to that of Sodom, and it was destroyed. How about Egypt? It means that they are like Egypt, of which Moses and Aaron had fought against the Pharaoh, the king, who had been disrupting God's work. In today's time as well, these two witnesses are killed here while fighting against the evil forces. And also there is a place where the Lord was crucified. Jesus was without sin. And it was referring to this rebellious Jerusalem that killed Jesus, who was without sin, who was innocent. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, Jesus said that he must go to Jerusalem and be killed and then rise again on the third day. In the same way, today as well, these witnesses are killed. At the first coming, Jesus was physically killed. But in the work of the second coming, these two witnesses are spiritually killed, and that is the difference. It also says here that men from every tribe, people, language, and nation will gaze upon their dead bodies. Now, who are these people? These are the saints of the tabernacle who belong to the destroyer and other ordinary church members. They are the people's tribes, languages, and nations. Why is that? Because in Revelation chapter 13 verse 7, it is said that this beast has its authority over the tribes, peoples, languages, and nations. And so we should know that these people belong to the beast and that is where the devil is. Revelation chapter 17 verse 15 is the same. They gaze on the body for three and a half days. They looked on the witnesses. And it means that they were mocking and looking on the witnesses who could no longer testify or prophesy. They became spiritually dead, so they could not testify, they could not prophesy, and they were not able to fulfill their duty. And so this is a spiritual death that they were in, and these people were watching them for the three and a half days. How did it happen in reality? No one knew until the prophecy was fulfilled, but when it fulfills, there are actual entities. This actual period for three and a half days was from January 30th, 1981 to February 2nd, 1981, the three and a half days. And it said that these people refused to bury the bodies, 
So let's find out what these graves are. The grave refers to the organization of the destroyers. In Luke chapter 11 verse 44, Jesus said to the Pharisees and the scribes who invaded Jerusalem that they were spiritual tombs. And in Matthew chapter 23, verse 27, that they are whitewashed tombs. Because a Jewish tomb was flat, the passerbys would not know that it was a tomb. And especially these whitewashed tombs, painted white, the people would not realize that it's a tomb. And so it was talking about the organization of these destroyers. What it means to refuse burial for the two witnesses is that the two witnesses would not be allowed to join their denomination or their church. Would you accept people who call you as a demon or a destroyer into your congregation? What does it mean then that they were overjoyed by the death of the two witnesses and that they sent gifts to each other? Now that the two witnesses have stopped speaking this word of judgment, the people no longer have to listen to it, and so they exchange these words of joy amongst themselves as if they were a gift. Let's read 11 to 14 now. Revelation 11, verses 11 to 14. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, while their enemies looked on. At that very hour, there was a severe earthquake, and a tenth of the city collapsed. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. The third woe is coming soon. This here is about the work of the two witnesses who received the breath of life and were resurrected three and a half days after they were killed. The two witnesses were given the breath of life and they stood back up. What is this breath of life? The breath of life in Chinese characters is made up of two characters, one to live and the other of energy. Thus, the breath of life refers to the energy that allows one to live. In the Bible, this breath of life is only the Word of God. The Bible shows that the Word of God, the breath of life, enters into a person and allows that person to come back to life. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, it says that he made the man out of the dust of the earth, breathed into him the breath of life, and the man became a living being. In other words, his spirit came to life. And in John chapter 1, where does it say that there is life? In John chapter 1 verse 4, it says that in the word there is life. What does it mean, then, that the two witnesses ascended into heaven on a cloud? This cloud refers to being guided by the Spirit. And at this time, the two witnesses enter the heavenly tabernacle on earth to start sounding the trumpet there again. At that time, the enemies and those who are watching would be surprised. Who are these enemies who are watching? They are the group of Satan. And because they are the people who have rebelled against God, they also become enemies too. The people at the time thought that the two witnesses were done, that they were finished. But when they started to testify again, their hearts were greatly shaken. And that is why it says that this great city had collapsed in the earthquake. Just as an earthquake happens when the ground shakes, the people's hearts that shake is also referred to as an earthquake. And what is this earthquake here? It's what's happening in the hearts of these people, the spiritual earthquake that shakes their hearts greatly. What does it mean then that a tenth of the great city had collapsed? It is the organization of the tabernacle temple that began to collapse by one tenth. This tabernacle had joined together with the destroyers and eventually collapses entirely, but here it begins to collapse one tenth. And it was said that the number of those who were killed was 7,000. But it's not about all the churches of the world, but about the saints of the tabernacle of the seven golden lampstands who betrayed. On the other hand, there are the remaining people here who return glory to God. And who are these people? It's referring to the people 
who had been measured by the two witnesses. The outer court had already been taken over by the Gentiles. And these people, once again, who are they? Those who have been measured by the two witnesses. Now let's read verses 15 through 19. Revelation 11, verses 15 to 19. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders, who were seated on their thrones before God, fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and you have begun to reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your saints, and those who reverence your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the Ark of the Covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake and a great hailstorm. You've read well. The context of the text here is the seventh trumpet and the kingdom of God. When the seventh trumpet is sounded, the kingdom of the world will become the kingdom of God. And this seventh trumpet is the most important content in this entire main reference. What is it? It is God's victory and God's salvation that is unfolded here on this earth. As we have learned in Revelation chapters 8 and 9, what was the content of the first to the sixth trumpets? It was announcing the destruction of God's chosen people. However, here in these references, there is a seventh trumpet, and there is a mystery of God. We learned about this in Revelation chapter 10 verse 7. Do we remember that when the seventh angel sounds the trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just like the gospel that was preached to his servants, the prophets. And what was the content? It is the amazing secret that the kingdom of the world will become the kingdom of God. Up until now, when we talked about the kingdom of God, we thought about the place that we go to after we die. But when the seventh angel sounds a trumpet, the kingdom of the world where death had reigned becomes a kingdom of God where life will reign. And from this point onwards, Jesus will return, and He will reign on this earth forever and ever. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 through 54 contains this promise of resurrection and eternal life on this earth. It says that the martyrs will be resurrected with the holy spiritual body and we who are alive will be transformed. It is the wonderful mystery of God that we will be transformed and thus death is swallowed up by life and we will enter into eternal life. To all the pastors around the world, seminarians, and all saints and believers, do not think that this is strange just because we've never known or understood about this before. It was a mystery of God, so only God had known about it. And so I hope that we open up our hearts and enter into this resurrection and the hope of eternal life together. Everyone, you have done well coming to this seminar. And in order to reach this resurrection and eternal life, all mankind must hear the sounding of this seventh trumpet and know the true God, Jesus, and the one whom He had sent. In order to have eternal life, in John chapter 17, verse 3, it says that we have to understand the true God and the one whom He had sent. And how can we know them? There is only one way. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 27, it says that only the Son and to those whom the Son chooses to reveal Him can know. At the time of the first coming, All the prophecies of the Old Testament, this mystery of God, could only be heard through Jesus. 
And today, where is this revelation of Jesus? From what we've learned, it went into the new John. And so the revelation of Jesus, the New Testament opened by Jesus, has entered into the new John, so we must therefore meet the new John and listen to the word through him. We must listen carefully, and then we'll be able to receive this wonderful blessing of eternal life. What will happen when this world becomes the kingdom of God? The Gentiles will become angry. Why is that? The Gentiles will become angry because the kingdom of the world that they had controlled now becomes the kingdom of God and they'll be judged at the end. But aren't all the heavens and the earth created by God? There is nothing wrong with seeking God again and for God to reclaim everything. It is said that He will judge those who destroy the earth. And this is the content of judging those who have swallowed up God's tabernacle. And I hope that you will listen to this content when Revelation chapter 16, 17, and 18 are testified. When the seventh trumpet is sounded, the Gentile destroyers will burst into anger and be judged, but those who fear the name of the Lord will be rewarded. What kind of reward? They will receive the twelve blessings that were recorded in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. And this will be explained clearly in Revelation chapters 19, 20, and 21. There will be the marriage of the spirit and the flesh, the first resurrection, and God and the kingdom of heaven from the spiritual world will come here to this earth. Let me ask everyone a question. Dear pastors and all the people, the believers, seminarians, and the saints, Will you be angry when you hear the sounding of the seventh trumpet? Or will you be rewarded in reverence for the name of the Lord? I sincerely hope that everyone will receive all the blessings and the rewards in reverence for the name of the Lord, and in particular our pastors. Please learn and teach your saints well so that we can enter into the kingdom and eternal life together. And I believe that you will all do so. Now, the last verse, chapter 11, verse 19, it says that God's temple is open and there is a great hailstorm there. What does it mean when a new temple of God is opened? It means that the existence of God's new temple is beginning to become widely known throughout the world. And let's take a look at this reality. Before these prophecies fulfilled, we could not testify because there was no reality. However, when this is accomplished, we must know that there is a reality, an actual fulfillment. Jesus said, I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. Let's take a look at this reality. It is the establishment of Shincheonji Church of Jesus, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony. Shincheonji Church of Jesus is, if you look at Revelation chapter 21, the new heaven and new earth. And it is there that Jesus teaches it is the church of Jesus. And it is testifying about the betrayal and the destruction, and so it becomes the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony. This was established on March 14, 1984. Just like it is here in the drawing, this was a time when the Temple of the Tabernacle of the Testimony started to become widely known throughout the world. This year marks the 38th year since Shincheonji was established on this earth. And so all our pastors, seminarians, and people, we are conveying the good news that Shincheonji Church of Jesus, the Temple of the Tabernacle of Testimony, which God and Jesus has so desired, has been established here on this earth. This is a time of great hope. Now when God's temple is opened, it says that there is a great hailstorm that is there. Now that the temple has been opened, we can see what is inside of it. There is the Ark of the Covenant, and there is lightning, and there were loud peals of thunder, and there is the great hailstorm. The Ark of the Covenant is the vessel that contains the covenant, and so it is the words of the covenant. 
And this presence of the lightning refers to the rapid movement of spirits. And the loud peal of thunder can be understood as the voice of God. And this is talking about the ecclesiastical movement of God's governing body. And what else is here in this temple? There is a big hailstorm. And there are people in this world who teach that this is a nuclear bomb, an atomic bomb. But if this is an atomic bomb, then it should be in a weapon storage, not in the temple of God. That is man's teaching then, and we must understand what this truly means. What is hail? Hail is something that happens when it rains. And because rain is the word of God, this word of wrath and the shepherd who carries this word becomes this great hail and the hailstorm. So the word of wrath is hail. And the shepherd who has received this word is like the hail and the hailstorm as well. Let's now draw the conclusion for Revelation 11, the two witnesses and the seventh trumpet. That was a title. As we mentioned in the beginning, when these two witnesses of Jesus finished their testimony, they were sacrificed to the abyss that came up from the abyss, and they were resurrected after three and a half days and they sounded the seventh trumpet. This seventh trumpet was the mystery of God as recorded in Revelation chapter 10, verse 7, a mystery that only God knows. And what was it? It is the amazing mystery that the kingdom of the world that was ruled by death becomes a kingdom of God where life will reign. This was the most important content of Revelation chapter 11, which was verse 15. It means that Because there is the kingdom of God, the dead will live again with the spiritual bodies. Those who are alive will be transformed and eternal life will be accomplished. This was the last trumpet that 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 through 54 had stated. Today, I earnestly pray that all mankind will meet the new John who is the seventh trumpet, receive the revelation of Jesus, Know the true God and Jesus and the promised pastor and enter into the kingdom of heaven and have eternal life. According to the Bible, in John chapter 17 verse 3 and Matthew chapter 11 verse 27, eternal life is known by knowing the true God and the one whom he has sent. Therefore, I hope that you will all meet the new John who has received this word of revelation, learn the word well, and enter into heaven and eternal life. God's new covenant, the prophecy and fulfillment of revelation. Let us end the testimony of Revelation chapter 11 here. There is one Bible, there is one God, there is one heaven, And we are one. Shall we all shout this together? We are one. Thank you for listening until the end. And we will pray to our Father God. Father God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, we are extremely grateful to you. At this time, when the words of the new covenant revelation that you and Jesus have desired are being fulfilled, the chairman of Shinchenji, who received the revealed word according to your promises and had seen all the events, are testifying this word of revelation together with the 12 tribe leaders who were established and taught. We believe that this is a blessing of heaven and your love. Father, please open our hearts and allow us to be moved by the Holy Spirit so that all the pastors, seminarians, and all saints in every country around the world who hear these words can understand. And above all, I earnestly pray that you will help our pastors to understand this word well, teach their congregation well, and lead them to heaven and eternal life together. I pray that the limitless grace and love be with all who hear these words forever. And in the name of our loving Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.
The red dragon that entered into heaven looks very strange. Would there be any beast that looks like this on earth? Then we need to understand the entity of this red dragon which entered into heaven. Who is the male child who will rule with an iron scepter? There is no doubt that this is so important, especially for Christians. Coming this Thursday, the tribe leader, Jung Chun Seok, of the Matthew tribe will deliver the words of Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12 is about the war between the dragon and God. The time will be the same at 10 a.m. I hope that you will attend and have the time of grace to understand the true meaning of the book of Revelation, which all believers must know. The global village is shaking with the enthusiastic responses from pastors not only from Korea, but from all around the world. There are endless inquiries on how to become one family with Shincheonji in God and Jesus. If you contact the representative number of each tribe shown on the screen, we will kindly provide you detailed guidance about the Shincheonji Church and its doctrines in addition to the word of Revelation. Yes, now I will conclude by giving the prayer given by the Lord. Let us give the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This concludes the Shincheonji Online Seminar, Testimony on Prophecy and Fulfillment of Revelation, God's New Covenant. Thank you to everyone for joining us.